Hello and welcome to the Emotion Network podcast where we take a deep dive into the human condition. Um, and it's a bit of a different episode this week. Um, so uh, a couple of weeks ago when we did the uh, simulcast with the team from Mind Tools, uh, a member of the team came on the podcast and she enjoyed it so much. She's back today, which I'm really excited about. Um, so, uh, and also the format's going to be a bit different. So even though I'm welcoming you, dear fair listener, um, into this podcast, uh, I'll actually be handing over to our guest to do the, the hosting duties uh, today because this podcast was her idea. So um, uh, anyway, enough of me. Let's get our guest on the air. So welcome once again to the Emotion of World podcast, Lizzie feliki Pru. Hi, Lizzie. Hi, Phil. Thank you for having me host and having me on again. Very excited to be here. I'm delighted. I'm delighted that you're here as well. So it's super exciting. Really, really looking forward to it. Um, and also, I think because I don't know. I guess um, uh, I think when you when your idea for this episode, which was kind of like the take it back to basics idea, um, mm-hmm. I suppose in a way, maybe because I've been talking about emotions for so long, maybe I think I've, I've sort of said it all already. Um, and, and I think it was a mm-hmm. useful reminder that, um, that it can be all, it's stuff that's always good to say. So um, before we get into uh, before we get into the Emotion at Work podcast proper, then let's begin, as we always do, with our unexpected yet innocuous question. Um, and uh, my question for you then, Lizzo, will be your season of choice. Oh, that is a tricky question. I think my answer is going to be biased because I'm really enjoying and have been enjoying like autumn, winter mainly because I've been getting Christmassy very early. I think I'm going to go with autumn because I like that at the start of autumn, you can have kind of like quite mild, gentle weather. You've got some sun and then you transition into winter. I really like that transition phase. I love like when all the leaves turn golden. Yeah, it's just, I think it's a beautiful time of year. So I'm going to go autumn. Yeah, I think it's spring for mm-hmm. me. Um, I, I mean, I love sun um, uh, and I do enjoy the summer. Um, and, uh, mm-hmm. and I think it's spring for me. Um, spring feels like, um, yeah, it's, it's when you, I, I don't know, I can start to get out running. It's easier to get back out running again, um, mm-hmm. because the days are getting a bit longer. Um, so kind of early morning runs without either a head torch on or, or, you know, loads of high vis, um, become, you know, mm-hmm. become more practical and more, um, yeah, more safe, I guess. Um, so yeah, 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 spring for me. Yeah, I love spring. I always associate spring with rain. I think because yeah, it, my birthday is in spring and it always rains around my birthday. It's like the end of March and it's always just not nice weather. So I think I like the uh, idea of spring and then the reality always disappoints me. But yeah, okay. Um, well, hopefully then today's podcast because it was your idea, the reality won't disappoint. So fingers crossed, no pressure on me then uh, to make sure that the, uh, the, mm-hmm. <laughs> that the, that the reality of this episode is as good as the, is as good as the idea that, uh, that you came up with. So why don't we start with that then? What, what kind of prompted your idea for this particular episode? So I think a couple of things, I think obviously I do a lot of um, research into our podcasts, uh, podcasts so far. It's kind of like how I've built up my knowledge around emotions and emotion intel- emotional intelligence sort of having joined this job with not loads of prior background knowledge and I was just mm-hmm. thinking like I think I know bits and bobs like are about lots of different things but I don't feel like I have a good solid basis yet and I think just having a podcast where we could just get all the key I guess like fundamental elements of like what are emotions how should we even begin to start trying to understand and manage them? I mm. felt like having an episode where all of that was laid out would just be super useful. So it was a very selfish motivation. It was just for me. And then I kind of thought, well, if I feel like that, then I'm, you know, I'm sure there are other people that do. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's where it came from. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Sounds like a great idea then. Um, so... Uh, should we? Uh, I, at this point, then I have no idea what's coming next. So, uh, so let's hand it over to you, yes. and then uh, I'll let you host from here on in. Oh, okay. Well, thank you, Phil, for agreeing in advance to answer all my questions. Um, I guess I wanted to start by like getting down, as I said, the fundamentals. And so I thought quite a good question to open with would be: imagine you're speaking to someone who 
knows they have feelings, but they don't really know what to do with them or how to even start managing them. What three things would you advise to someone who was wanting to just manage their emotions a little bit better? So I like those three things because there's always three. Um, uh, I, I love there being three <laughs> things. Um, uh, so, um, and I kind of don't want to answer the question to begin with in that um, mm-hmm. there's, there's a, I'm a big fan of language and, and I think um, being particular and being, I guess, conscious of language, I think is really important. So I, I don't like the phrase, um, and I, I still use it. So I'm not saying I, this is a phrase that it, you know I've erased from my language, um, or it's a phrase that um, that I don't use. I just I, I don't like it because that phrase around managing emotions. Um, I, I don't think I know anybody mm-hmm. who likes to be managed. You know, like if you're being performance managed, or if you're be you if you're having your impression managed, or if you're you know. A, a, because it implies, um, I don't know, it implies a degree of of, of superiority because you, you've got power over something or someone. Um, mm-hmm. uh, it brings implications of control, I guess, in a way. Um, mm-hmm. And so for me, it's about working with emotions. And, and rather than, because I think it, it implies because there's this, there's this narrative around thoughts and feelings and how kind of thoughts mm-hmm. are more, I don't know, more valid or more important or more appropriate or, or more whatever it might be, that thoughts are better than feelings. And so it's almost like my, mm-hmm. my thoughts are, are managing my emotions because my emotions are, 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 are like are reckless or are inappropriate or need managing in in some way Mm -hmm. um so i prefer working with um uh, i I use managing emotions because it's a phrase that other people understand so and it's a phrase that the so if i said you know Mm -hmm. how do you manage your emotions other people would know what i meant by it i'm just also not a great big fan of it because because of all the reasons that uh, that Mm -hmm. um so that's my non-answer to the question and then if i actually answer the question um so one thing is um emotions happen because we care um and so if you're experiencing an emotion of some sort or you're experiencing feelings of something if you didn't care you wouldn't feel so you only have emotions because mm-hmm. it because there's some because there's something happening that you care about it could be something happening to you. It could be something mm-hmm. happening to other people. It could be something happening in a situation. It could be um, something to do with your values or your morals. It could be something to do with your identity and how you see yourself. But if you don't care, you won't feel. So um, if your emotions are there, that means that that's something that you care about. So what I think might be helpful is then to break care down a little bit more. Um so mm-hmm. by breaking care down, I'm going to say that it's some, that means it's something that involves something that's important to you and or it's okay. something relevant to your goals. So something is happening mm-hmm. in you, around you, in your head um, that you care about and you care about it either because it's important to you or because it's relevant to your goals. So, for example... Um, and also this can um, this this level of care can correlate with the intensity of the emotion so if I think about a real kind of classic mm-hmm. example um, I know you're learning to drive at the moment um, and so there yes. will be times where somebody kind of cuts you up where they pull in in front of you or mm-hmm. where uh, or maybe you pull in front of somebody else or you're driving along and you're a bit slower than the person mm-hmm. behind would like you to be and and then an emotion comes Mm -hmm. so why does that emotion come well probably because if you're driving somewhere you've got somewhere to go you have a goal because if you're in your vehicle and you're Mm -hmm. moving you're trying to get somewhere so your goal commonly is to get to wherever it is that you want to get to um and it's and it might be important to you to get there and then something so another in this example another vehicle is in your way um now if you Mm -hmm. were early 
for where you wanted to get to. So let's say you're trying to get to um, let's say you're trying to get to a job interview and you're late. Then that thing being in your way mm-hmm. is likely to bring a more intense emotion because that job interview is important to you mm-hmm. and you know you're already late. Mm-hmm. So the degree of, of emotion that you're likely mm-hmm. to experience is going to be more intense because of the relative importance or relative relative relevance to your goal. If I contrast that with you're going shopping and there's no there's mm-hmm. no deadline, there's you know, you don't need to be there at a particular time. Yes, shopping is 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 important because you need sustenance, you need fuel for your body, but beyond that, you know, or you know, or you need whatever it is you're gonna buy. But if you're in no particular rush, you know you mm-hmm. need to get there, but you're not pressed for time and, and or any of those things, then you might be mildly annoyed, but the degree of intensity of the emotion will be less. So mm-hmm. if I suppose the first thing for me is if you're experiencing an emotion, there's something going on that you care about. Mm-hmm. So the question I would encourage you then to consider is, what is it about this that I care about? Or maybe if you were to break it down, mm-hmm. what is it about this situation that's important to me? Or how is this situation relevant to my goals? Because if you can figure mm-hmm. that out, then that helps you with understanding what it is that's kind of brought that emotion forth for you. Um, mm-hmm. So if you can figure out what's important and or how that thing is relevant to your goals, then it's likely that that will help you understand more about um, kind of what that emotion is doing there and what it's trying to do for you. Because mm-hmm. if you if you don't perceive it to be important, then you won't pay attention to it and you won't have the feeling. If, mm-hmm. So if if it doesn't matter and it's irrelevant, then it won't be important. And, and that might be an example like um, litter. So some people get really annoyed mm-hmm. about litter on the street. Other people just don't care. Mm-hmm. So if and and it could and, I, and there's a risk of a, of a that this could come across like I'm being judgmental or that I'm judging people for it, and, and I'm not. I, I, this for me, it's a it's an everyday example of. If mm-hmm. if I don't care about the environment that I'm in, and if I don't care about the place that that I am, and I'm not interested in uh, in mm-hmm. the aesthetic kind of the aesthetics of that location, then I'll just walk past the litter and I won't and it won't make any difference to me. It won't make me angry. It won't make me happy. I'll just walk past it being indifferent because I just don't care. It's not important to me. It's not relevant to my goals. Whereas for others, they might that might really frustrate them because there's something. Um, happening there that um, Mm -hmm. is important to them and relevant to their goals Um, a similar example might be Mm -hmm. um, I if I saw my my any of my children if my son or my daughters at the airport to greet me when I got home as a surprise I would care deeply about that Mm -hmm. because they're really important to me and they're really relevant Mm -hmm. to my goals Um, but, but the random stranger next to me doesn't care so they're not going to feel anything. They don't care about the fact that my mm-hmm. kids are stood over there because they're nothing to do with them. There's, they're, they're of no relevance to their goals and they're not important to them in any way. Um, so, yeah. Okay. So it felt like a very long... I mean, I'm known for giving long answers. But anyway, so what what are three things um, somebody will want to know about getting better at, at um, working with their emotions? So I suppose the first thing is about not judging mm-hmm. it. So... If it's mm-hmm. there, it's there because you've deemed it to be important in some way or somehow. Mm-hmm. And so what can be helpful then is to try and figure out what it is about that thing that's important to you. Mm-hmm. Um, the second thing is that um, emotions are often viewed as things that only come or only happen when something external to us is occurring. So let's use the examples I've just chosen. So I've chosen um, a, so a vehicle being in front of you or in your way when you're trying to get somewhere, um, litter mm-hmm. on the ground, and uh, children being at an airport. The three examples that I used. And mm-hmm. all of those are things outside of me. So they're things that, they're, they're, they're things mm-hmm. that might trigger me, I guess, to use a, a common word of trigger. They're things that might trigger me that are outside of, outside of me. That I'm then perceiving through my through mm-hmm. my five senses, through what I can see and hear and taste and touch mm-hmm. and smell, 
um, I'm interpreting them or perceiving those things as important and doing something with it. Um, so a second thing for me then is that emotions also happen from within. So yes. things that things that we remember, things that we imagine, mm-hmm. and things that we dream, also bring those emotions forth. So this this perceptional mm-hmm. thing. So I describe it as a. I, I was in. So when I uh, I first started to do some work a few years ago with uh, a company called the Emotional Intelligence Academy or EIA group, as they're known. Um, and, and we started talking about mm-hmm. this radar, the idea that we've constantly got this radar running. And this radar is running and it's looking for things Mm -hmm. that are important. It's looking for things that we care about. Um, And one of the challenges with the radar metaphor is that it's like the radar beams out. So if you imagine your your senses of the radar, they're beaming out and they're they're looking for things. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, though, the radar goes internally. So um, Mm -hmm. if, if we remember something that's happened to us in the past, then that can bring the emotions again because those things are still important to us um and they're still relevant to to our goals so something might happen um something might happen for me in first thing in the morning and then when i remember that thing as i work my way through the day the emotions come back it's not like i've had something Mm -hmm. outside of me happen or occur and it might be that i don't know maybe i had an argument with a member of my family in the kitchen so when i walk into the kitchen i then go oh yeah i remember that Mm -hmm. argument i had in here this morning um so it could be that i suppose Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but memories come from lots of different places so um yeah emotions can can be brought forth or triggered from external stuff Uh, they can also be brought forth or triggered Mm -hmm. from internal stuff so that could be things we remember that could be things that we imagine um and it could Mm -hmm. be things that we that we dream Mm -hmm. so um, I guess when when you were preparing to do the role that you're doing now on the podcast, you might have been ma- imagining how it's going to mm-hmm. go. So how is it going to feel interviewing Phil? What questions am I going to ask him? How might it feel if if he talks forever, like he does often? Um, so you and that might bring different emotions mm-hmm. for you, and and that's where you're imagining what it will be mm-hmm. like. Um, so yeah, so emotions can come from outside and from, or emotions can be triggered or brought forth from outside mm-hmm. or um uh or from within um and then the third thing i would say mm-hmm. is um a, it's it's in, it's nearly impossible to not feel them so if you go mm-hmm. with you if you're looking to channel your your inner elsa of of conceal don't feel um it's nigh on impossible to to stop emotions because emotions are are there mm-hmm because they save our lives um that radar that Mm -hmm. that we've got running is there to protect us it's looking for it's 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 there to protect us and and enrich our lives so it's looking for things that um sustain us and 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 we Mm -hmm. enjoy or find pleasurable it's also looking for for challenges and risks and threats um so it's yeah it's nigh on impossible to um to not feel so i would say there's no point in trying you you're better off thinking about how Mm -hmm. how do i work with those emotions when they happen Um, there's a a book called Mm -hmm. um emotions revealed uh, by a guy called paul ekman which Mm -hmm. is this my incredibly masculine book when i'm reading it on the train look at me with my bright pink book um um uh, and then and in that, he talks about catching the spark before the flame. So, so the emotion happens, mm-hmm. and it's how how can you catch the spark before it kind of goes big, before the before the flame takes hold? And I see that a lot in um, in, in some of the work that we do with our clients. So, mm-hmm. uh, one of the the pieces of what we're doing at the moment, we're working hard on on reducing the the knee jerk reactions. So. Uh, we've got a client that we're working with mm-hmm. is working on a on a particular construction project that's really important um, for lots of different reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also late, so there's a lot of pressure on it because it's it's late and, and we need to get it on time. Um, and also, um, it, a lot of people have invested a lot of time and effort and energy into wanting this project to be a success. So when something goes wrong, mm-hmm. we kind of go. Whoosh, 
you know the it, the 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 we the something goes wrong it triggers an emotion and the flame just catches really really quickly and so what i'm working on with that mm-hmm. team is, is how can we how can we catch the spark before the flame goes whoom. um that's a i don't know where mm-hmm. that noise has just come from but anyway um uh, how, yeah how do we catch yeah, the spark works. before the flame so yeah so they would be my uh my three things that somebody wanting to get better at managing mm-hmm. their emotions or working with their emotions um should know yeah that was all really really interesting um it got me thinking do we all feel like the same emotions as in is there a set range of emotions that humans feel and are they consistent across like a group of people or do we all feel different emotions like um so the answer is both um uh, Mm -hmm. and and the answer is both for, for a few different reasons so um everybody's different and so and and it links back to the example i gave earlier on about um my kids at an airport that's an example they would mean something to me but they wouldn't mean anything to anybody else i would i I can't say they wouldn't mean anything to you because Mm -hmm. if you knew they were my kids and because you know me then you 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 might feel something Mm -hmm. because you know there's something within there that you care about Mm -hmm. um uh and so what's what's important to me might be different what's important to me or relevant to my goals might be different than to what's important to you and or relevant to your goals so we we might both feel anger as a feeling as an emotion mm-hmm. and we might feel that anger for different things so that's yeah. so that's where i'm saying there's there's an element of universality yes and there's an element of difference in there as well so there are seven uh well i say seven so th- so paul ekman who i mentioned earlier on so he, he was really interested in universality of emotion um and not universality mm-hmm. of experience though so he wasn't interested in do do everybody feel emotion does everybody does every human feel the same emotions in the same way so he wasn't necessarily interested in that mm-hmm. He was interested in the universal expression of emotion. Um, so are there some universalities right. in the way that people express emotions? Um, and, and what mm-hmm. he found, or what his research found was seven. Um, it started off with five, then it became six, and then it became seven. Um, and if you were to go yeah. into the peer review literature, there is a, a high degree of agreement on five. So most emotion researchers mm-hmm. agree that there are what some call five basic emotions that have um, expressions that go with it. And those being happiness, sadness, um, anger, fear, and disgust. Happiness, then, sadness, anger, uh, fear. Yes. And then the two that are up for debate are surprise and contempt. Mm-hmm. so surprise because okay. is it an emotion so mm. some people argue that it's not an emotion so i, I suppose it, it, maybe it then takes us back to we we need to define what emotions are so mm-hmm. what emotions do is they bring our attention to something that we deem to be important or relevant to our goals and then and then mm-hmm. there are associated psychological and psychological, physiological and behavioral outcomes that occur as a result. So psychological mm-hmm. being we think things, things go on inside our head, physiological being things go on inside our bodies, and then behavioral being something happens that others could perceive. So face expressions would be a good example of that. So uh, my radar's running it perceives something that's important to me or relevant to my goals um it then does something to me psychologically where i go oh there's that um and, it, uh, and maybe an everyday example might be hearing your name in a crowded room so you're, you're in a room where there's lots of other mm-hmm. people and then you hear your name um so you, we when that we're because that's something that's really important to us is our name and it's relevant to our goals because it's about us. Um, we often orient we orient ourselves to that. So when we hear it, we're like, oh, and we'll, and we'll turn our head to wherever the the, the sound came from. Um, 
and uh, and so we have all three things there. So the radar's running. Psychologically, it goes like that. It has an impact on me physiologically because it might spike. Um, mm-hmm. uh, it might spike my adrenal gland because I'm like, oh, somebody's mentioning me that, I, and, and and they're not in my immediate circle. So why are they talking about me? Maybe I'm now a bit nervous. Um, and there's a behaviour which is I turn my mm-hmm. head to whatever it was that, that came. Mm-hmm. So the stem that argue surprise is an orienting response because surprise is a like a station mm. on the way to somewhere else. So when I turn around and I see it's um, so if I'm I don't know let's say I'm in a I'm in a in a busy room in London where as far as I'm aware you're in Leeds and then I hear your voice saying mm-hmm. Bill and then I turn around and then I'm and then I'm like oh you're not meant to be here mm-hmm. that's that's an uh, that's an unexpected thing mm-hmm. but then I'm happy because it's nice to see you um, whereas mm-hmm. if I hear my voice and I turn around and there's somebody moving at me at pace that potentially could be a threat to me then i might then have mm-hmm. fear in response rather than uh, than happiness so so surprise mm-hmm. is like a a station on the way to another um to another destination because there's a, there's another emotion that follows surprise mm-hmm. um and then contempt is the other one that's again that some some researchers agree some researchers differ um uh, and partly that's because of the um uh, of the moralness of contempt because contempt is about feeling superior to somebody else um mm-hmm. and there's other criteria that different people look at so um uh, so david matsumoto for example who used to work with paul ekman he and ekman both uh, have a view that um if you're looking for universality of expression of emotion then those expressions need mm-hmm. to be present in primates because there's an evolutionary um mm-hmm. there's an evolutionary component to it in terms of you know, we we as humans have evolved from primates and therefore and so on um and there is evidence to suggest that contempt is as a face expression as a, in this example is shown by mm-hmm. the dominant primate in a pack as an example um mm-hmm. so there is some there is some date there's, the, there's a, the degree of agreement it varies those first five high mm-hmm. degree of agreement and then the other two yeah, there's uh, there's some kind of discussion around it um mm-hmm. uh, and, and what sort of ekman matsumoto and others um so, sort of what they suggest is that each of those emotions have a universal trigger so uh, and also mm-hmm. each of those emotions are sort of a, a they have a, a range of intensity within them so if you looked at, um, at happiness, for example, happiness might range from um, amusement all the way up to mm-hmm. um, intense joy, whereas, um, mm-hmm. or elation, maybe. Would, you, would I put elation above joy? Yeah, probably. Um, whereas anger might go from, I don't know, annoyance or irritation up to rage. Um yeah, exactly. Yeah. And whereas fear might go from butterflies up to petrified. Um mm-hmm. and, and and one of the things that somebody like Lisa Feldman Barrett argues, for example. So Lisa Feldman Barrett's an author, she wrote um a book called How Emotions Are Made, which is also on my bookshelf. I could go get it if I wanted to. Um and one of the things that she would argue is that uh, emotions are words. So what we use are, are words mm-hmm. as, as labels to describe the, the feelings and the sensations that, that we experience. And so, therefore, mm-hmm. um, the words we use to describe how we feel are socially, um, they're defined socially. They're defined by those that we, that we're brought, you know, the, those that we surround ourselves with in, with socially as we mm-hmm. kind of grow and evolve so she's less in the emotions of universal camp and she thinks that they're socially constructed in that way um mm-hmm. because we have to have find a way to label emotions and so um we use words to do so now where i would disagree with lisa feldman barrett in that example is that there's also been um uh, some research done uh, I think it was in by Numenar and all at Numenar et al in 2013 in terms of the physiological bit. So, you know, I said mm-hmm. emotions can be sad. They have psychological, physiological and behavioral components. So 
one of the physiological yeah. changes are things like what happens with our heart rate, what happens with our blood pressure, what happens with the different mm-hmm. hormones that we might have with um, within us. So, you know, when does the adrenal gland activate and things like that. And Numenara told did a, um, a piece of a research where they asked people to physiologically describe the emotions. Um, and then what they found was a degree mm-hmm. of universality across cultures in terms of the physical way that people yeah. experience emotions so do they experience heat or do they experience mm-hmm. coldness where do they experience is it in their is it in their face in their hands in their arms in their stomach in their chest and things like that we'll put a link to the paper in the show notes um uh so mm-hmm. so i yeah so i suppose like i feel like i'm now just like citing loads of research papers so let's stop doing that and be more practical um, no, it's really interesting. Um, sorry, I was just going to ask um, on that point. Was there anything that indicated that we there's a degree of universality about how we recognise emotions? So even across cultures or, say, different languages, do people still recognise the same sort of, I don't want to say physical symptoms, but physical attributes to, like, oh, that is sadness, that is anger. Was Is there, I don't know if you've yeah if you know about any research yeah. into that side of things yeah yeah so um so face expression wise yes um so there's a mm-hmm. there's a big body of research around the universality of face expression across culture um mm-hmm. and also across um sighted and visually impaired people as well so that visual impairment could be blind or it could be mm-hmm. um visually impaired so if you were to look at the um if you were to look at the um so the, so the Lisa Feldman Barrett or Margaret Mead, who are two emotion researchers that, have, that um, support the socially constructed view of emotion, um, they would argue that mm-hmm. face expressions of emotions are learned from other people. So, um, right. uh, so if you think about the classic kind of peekaboo thing, um, so you would, mm-hmm. you know, if you, if, you, if it was a baby, you cover your eyes, you go, oh, where's so and so gone? And then you, when you open them, you open your eyes wide, you drop your mouth open, and you go, boo, um, which is the prototypical surprise yeah. expression. So somebody's disappeared. Oh, look, they're back, mm-hmm. um, and it's unexpected. So they would argue that it's it could be socially learned. And so um, what uh, David Matsumoto in particular was interested in is um, how do facial expressions of emotions. Um, appear on those that might be visually impaired um, because they've mm-hmm. had, they've had no, they've got no way of of learning that socially constructed mm-hmm. view if the if the expression of if the if face expressions of emotions are socially constructed then mm-hmm. those that haven't been able to see wouldn't be able to learn that mm-hmm. these face expressions exist and so therefore wouldn't replicate them and what he found with a high degree of correlation mm-hmm. was that they did so um right. so the uh so that there's a there's a big body of evidence that supports that that face expressions of emotion are universal where that universality differs is what might bring the emotion forth so what might trigger you to be scared or angry or happy might be different to what triggers me to be scared or angry or happy and the extent to which or the degree mm-hmm. to which of, or the intensity of which you are scared or angry or happy might be different to the extent to which I am scared or angry or happy. So so we had a good, mm-hmm. really good example of, of it this week. Um, so for the audience's benefit, um, on uh, earlier on this week, uh, the emotional work team all got together. Um, and uh, just over a week ago, about 10 days ago now, um, um, a couple of my social media accounts got hacked um, and uh, when we met a few days ago we were discussing it and a member of the team said I can't believe how calm you are about it um, I, I would be feeling really differently and, and that's a, a good example of how the same stimulus or the same thing happening social media account being hacked for mm-hmm. example how I felt about it was different to how a member of the team felt about it and that's not that I'm right and the member of the team's wrong it's that that's a really useful example of how the same thing can bring both a different in this example a different emotion and a different intensity of the emotion so it it bothered me but i wasn't Mm -hmm. i don't know i was maybe a 
I was probably more frustrated with the process of trying to get back into the account than I was um, mm-hmm. than I was in terms of the intensity of, of, of what had happened. Um, so yeah, so uh, so there's um, and and then what and then that might differ across cultures as well. Then so because what might be mm-hmm. important in England might be different to what's important in Finland or important in. Mm-hmm. Turkey or important in Singapore mm-hmm. um so yeah um yeah uh and then also like wasting the water. other because yeah yeah exactly yeah that's a, that's another useful example yes mm-hmm. because if in some areas it'd be really important mm-hmm. to save it and there's other areas it's like mm, yeah I mm-hmm. can just turn if I can turn the tap on again and more water will come yeah um Mm -hmm. the other thing you asked about is you so you didn't particularly ask about facial expressions that was where i took it so in terms of other behaviors in terms of universality um Mm -hmm. then the the next the next most researched communication channel would be the voice in terms of how how the voice Mm -hmm. changes in different emotions um and often that's because mm-hmm. of the physiological components. So I mentioned earlier on that emotions have this psychological, physiological, and uh, behavioral component. So when with the voice mm-hmm. in particular, you have a combination of the physiological component with the behavior component when the voice changes. So when people mm-hmm. experience fear, they they become tense that tension then impacts their vocal cords which makes their vocal cords Mm -hmm. lengthen which then sends the picture of the voice up here because the vocals become Mm -hmm. tight and 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 that physiological change then creates that change in the voice now one of the challenges with any with faith with face expressions or the voice is you can manipulate it so not everybody can do facial expressions or mm-hmm. not everybody can do all of the facial expressions because manipulating all of the muscles on your face can be hard. Um, uh, and also some mm-hmm. people can and can't manipulate their vocal cords. So um, uh, one of the things that happens often in uh, in anger is the, the release of, I think it's, um, uh, I think it's adrenaline and then the change in heart rate mm-hmm. and blood pressure causes the vocal cords to vibrate so it creates an edge so when someone's angry you get that you get that kind of growly bit in the voice and that's uh, and that's because of the physiological Mm -hmm. changes that are happening so in terms of the research into universality then i would say the most research or the most support most supported by research is face expressions followed by voice there's an amazing book um called uh the human voice by a lady called anne carp um, it's the best book on voice I've read. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, it also gives you a bit of a biology lesson. So it tells you um, how, mm-hmm. so it, it, it describes the physiological components in terms of the vocal cords, in terms of uh, the roof of your mouth, your tongue, uh, your palate, and how all of those things impact the production of noise out of your, um, uh, out of your mouth. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so I would say most research is, most research um, the most research, most supported research into universality, is face followed by uh, followed by voice. Um, then it's probably language. Mm-hmm. So there are mm-hmm. um, now language is a bit different though. So uh, the universality element of language depends on the language. So the right. so because we're using words to describe um, feelings and emotions. And those words differ across different cultures and different languages, then they start to become more kind of so you, you start to lose the universality across the globe, for example, that you might get with um, voice and with face expressions, but you can get some useful insight into language use across um, a particular language. Sorry, emotion use in language across a particular um, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, and then the. And then body language wise, so f- kind of physical movements, then mm-hmm. that's the most, um, that's probably the, the, the yeah, it, it's probably one of the most, so to, to quote my, one of my colleagues, sort of friends and colleagues, Aaron Garner, 
it's probably one of the most um, discussed but least researched areas of behaviour. Um, there's lots of mm-hmm. um, there's lots of stuff out there um, that doesn't have that universality bit behind it. So I'd probably say, right. in the if if I was to say, well, what's the most consistently researched thing? Then I would say it's movement. So um, kind of movement of the body mm-hmm. and that movement of the body towards or away from something. So normally, say normally, mm-hmm. what the research suggests is that commonly in fear, we'll move backwards and away from something. Commonly with mm-hmm. happiness or with anger, as examples, we'll move towards something. Um, and then mm-hmm. in surprise, we typically, well, typically, that's not even, I can't even say typically, and then in surprise then there's some research to suggest that we stay still which arguably plays into the mm-hmm. fight flight and freeze responses um uh, mm-hmm. but yeah so i'd go face voice words within a language and then body but there's no uh, and that's one of the things so there's a an ex-fbi agent called joe navarro and he wrote a book called what everybody is saying mm-hmm. um as in like what every body and everybody is saying um Mm -hmm. and um it's really interesting and i really enjoyed reading it and it's one person's view of the world and and that's where it becomes tricky so for Mm -hmm. example um Mm -hmm. uh there's a there's a but there's a body pose he describes as the cobra which is where somebody will put they'll interlace Mm -hmm. their fingers behind their head and put their elbows out as if you know, mm-hmm. the, you know like a as mm-hmm. a cobra snake would be that it's got the thin body and then it widens up around the head so it's described as the cobra mm-hmm. um and and that mm-hmm. is attributed to a power display so it's a display of power and dominance mm-hmm. as an example um mm-hmm. uh i do it when i'm hot and then i get really self-conscious of the sweat yeah, I, was like, having I do it my when arms. i'm like relaxed Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and so that and that's the that's the tricky bit is that taking a gesture like interlacing your fingers behind your head and spreading you know and then and then having your elbows out to the side, um, it's it's risky. It can be risky to say um, that movement or that gesture equals this meaning because you because you don't know. Um, uh, similarly, mm-hmm. like um, another one uh, that's. Uh, yeah anyway so fit like fidgeting is often described yeah, so if somebody fidgets they're nervous if they're constantly changing the the position that they're sat in um they're moving around a lot then that indicate indicates nervousness um, yeah it might also indicate i need a wee so you know it's, yeah. it's, it's hard it's hard to know and and i could take the same arguments of facial expressions because my face expression might might indicate to someone else that I'm experiencing a particular emotion, let's say disgust. So if I wrinkle my nose and raise my upper lip, mm-hmm. um, um, so that might indicate that I that I'm experiencing an emotion of disgust. But what that doesn't tell you is why. And you can't read my mind. You don't know yeah. why I might be disgusted. So there was mm-hmm. um, when I was learning all about face expressions mm-hmm. like ten years ago. Um, I was walking through Meadow Hall. Uh, which is a shopping centre in the UK and a city called Sheffield. And um, I was walking along holding my wife's hand and uh, this guy was walking towards us um, and I perceived his eye gaze to be in the direction of my wife, looked her up and down, then looked me up Mm -hmm. and down and then made a face expression of disgust. Now, I could... Mm -hmm. I could I could make that mean that he thought my wife was fit and I didn't deserve to be with her. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I could make that mean that um, uh, he thought he disapproved of my clothing and was offended by my by my choice mm-hmm. of clothing. It could be that um, mm-hmm. he was offended by the fact we were holding hands. Um, so uh, and that's the thing I don't know. Mm-hmm. So what? What I can know, mm-hmm. well, I say what I can know, what I can hypothesize with a high degree of, of reliability is that he was experiencing an emotion of disgust. What I don't know is why, because I can't mm-hmm. read his mind. 
Now I could then go and walk mm-hmm. next to him and ask him, "What were you thinking when you were looking me up and down just just then?" Um, um, mm-hmm. and, it, and also because I think as humans we're quite we're quite egocentric, so we often think things are about us. Yeah. Um, so mm-hmm. I don't know. Again, I had a good example this week where someone's behaviour had changed, and uh, and the the individual that was um, that was in the room with them was like, "Oh, what have I done? I've done something wrong. They're angry with me." Um, mm-hmm. You know, I've done, I've done, I've done, I've done something to upset or, or or something to this person because their behaviour with me is different to what it normally is. Um, and I said, okay, well, what else could it be though? I mean, it could be about you because you're amazing and you're fantastic, and mm-hmm. and, and of course, everything is about you naturally. And if it wasn't about you, what else could it be about? Oh, it could be about the meeting they had mm-hmm. before me. Yeah, what else could it be about? Something at home. Okay, what else? The next meeting they're going to. Okay, well, something they saw out the window. So exactly. So yes, it could be about you. It it also might not be. So mm-hmm. kind of having mm-hmm. those different hypotheses as to what it uh, what it could be, I think, is important. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Sorry, once again, yeah, I thought that really was a I very long a... answer. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that was a great answer. Um, yeah, it's all really interesting to hear how all the research sort of then links back to your the stuff that you're doing with clients on like a day-to-day basis and how you can apply that sort of very theoretical stuff to like very real situations that mm. I'm sure we've all been in situations where it, we instantly think that we've upset the person or annoyed them when it's nothing to do with us um so I guess we've kind of gone through the theory of emotions where they come from and how I guess we initially express them. I wanted to ask, what should a person do if they feel a really strong emotion coming on and they just, they know they're going to get overwhelmed by it and they're panicking about that. So I don't know, you could, something could have really upset you, but now is not the time or the place to express it. What should you do? Um... Uh, so I was going to say that's a really hard question to answer, and then you added that last bit on the end about it isn't the time and or place. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. Uh, so in which case, so there's, so broadly speaking, there are five. Um, so there are five families of, of what's called emotion regulation. Um, now you could argue that mm-hmm. emotion regulation is another term for emotion management. That's probably true. Um, uh, so there's a, a researcher called James Gross who um, is probably recognised as one of the world's leading researchers on um, on emotion regulation. I've got uh, I've got his book um, here on my on my desk. It's very big. Um, although it's not just all his work. Actually, mm-hmm. this one is a is a collection of papers from different emotion researchers across the globe. Um, but he talks about five different families of emotion regulation, um, and and of those five three are to do with when the emotion is there so when the emotion is already there there are three Mm -hmm. sort of primary ways that you could regulate it and then there's two that you can do either proactively or reactively so three reactively primarily and then there's two that are primarily proactively but you could use them especially one of them you could use um in a reactive way so i'm experienced i'm overwhelmed let's say i'm overwhelmed with sadness so that um uh, that mm-hmm. overwhelm is, is showing up maybe in terms of tears and I don't want to uh, I don't want to, to cry in, in this particular situation that I'm in mm-hmm. um, and so one of those three reactive responses is called um, response modulation which is where you are trying to mm-hmm. or you're, you're actively working to to either make the emotion bigger or smaller as you're feeling it mm-hmm. um, and one way to do that is to use the physiological part of your body to help you. So I talked earlier on about um, within an emotion, there's the psychological, the physiological, and the behavioral component. So what you're trying to control here is the behavior. That's what you're trying to control. You're trying to not cry Mm -hmm. in this particular example. So you can then use the physiological or the psychological bits to help you to help the behavior. So it's a bit like a, it's a bit like a feedback loop, maybe, or it's a two-way street. So in the same way that that you experience something that makes a psychological change, a physiological change, which changes your behavior, 
if you change your behavior you can mm-hmm. change your physiology which can then change what you think and then change the emotion mm-hmm. so you can do it kind of both ways around so for example mm-hmm. um the thing you always have with you wherever you are is your breath so uh, there's a book by john mm-hmm. kabat-zinn called wherever you go there you are and and in, and in that he's talking about the breath so wherever you as long as you're alive you have your breath and your breath mm-hmm. is a wonderful way of regulating your emotion because when you're um so for example commonly if you're sad um and and you're you're crying or you're going to cry your breath becomes short and you do a sometimes you mm-hmm. can do a number of in breaths and then an out breath so it mm-hmm. might be <sighs> So you're you're trying to to catch your breath in that way. Mm-hmm. So if you if you're feeling that overwhelm, then doing something like box breathing, as an example, can support that overwhelm. So breathe in, uh, and uh, box breathing of four might be too much because the emotion might be too strong. So it might be in for three, hold for one, out for three, in for three, hold out for three. Mm-hmm. Or you could do in for three, hold for two, out for three. Um, either way what you're aiming to do is to regulate your breathing because if you regulate your breathing it will tell your body that everything is okay so um you do open water swimming Mm -hmm. i do yeah so when you get in cold water what does your body want to do um your breath gets a lot shorter you kind of like tense up a lot um and your body definitely goes into like a sort of like very like high i don't know like it's like survival mode i guess yeah and so what and when you when you want to go in and then you're going to continue into the water because that's what you want to do what do you then do Mm -hmm. me personally just yeah trying to just like slow the breathing down and just like i think it's just like repeating why you're doing this and just yeah making sure that your body knows this is a very conscious decision that i am doing i am making myself do this it's a choice, not like a situation where I need to be concerned for my well-being because I'm okay. Wonderful. And and you've just described the the physiological um, strategy that I was in the same way. So I'm talking you know, initially. We were talking about mm-hmm. uh, we were talking about sadness and crying. It, it can be the same in this example with the with the temperature change and the fear of this is cold mm-hmm. and is uncomfortable. Um. Mm -hmm. Uh, that breath bit slowing your breathing down tells your body everything is okay so if 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 there's nothing if there's Mm -hmm. nothing else that you can control in the environment that you're in and you want to regulate how you're feeling regulate your breathing and your body will follow Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. and then and then secondly so there was another family that james gross talks about which is the idea of a cognitive change or reframe so it's where you think about something in a different Mm -hmm. way and I could, I'll, I'll pay you later for the amazing example that you just gave me. So you're, the thought you're having in your head is, this mm-hmm. is important to me. This is something I want to do. I am going to do mm-hmm. this and everything is going to be okay. So what you're doing mm-hmm. is you're thinking differently about the feelings that you're having to change the feelings that mm-hmm. you're having. So by, and then you're combining the two. I'm breathing deeply. This is something that I want to do. This is this is something I enjoy and I'm going to do it anyway. This is something I want to do. This is something I enjoy and I'm going to do it anyway. You know, so that you're combining two of those families mm-hmm. together by by modulating your response through your breathing and then um, changing what you're thinking. Now, there's other ways to modulate your response. The reason I went for breathing is because you always have it. It's always there. Um, mm-hmm. so other things that some people might do is they, they might, um, sort of pacify themselves somehow. So they might rub their hands together. Mm-hmm. They might, um, kind of, you know, rub their mm-hmm. hands on their, um, on their arms. They might rub their hands mm-hmm. on their legs. They might, um, kind of, you know, touch their face, cover their eyes, you know, some, some kind of, um, of, of element yeah. of, of touching themselves to calm themselves down because that that, mm-hmm. that might help them in that way i'm not saying it helps everybody but that's what some some people do um 
So yeah, so you've got that response modulation. How do I modulate the response? You've got that cognitive change or reframe. How do mm -hmm. I think differently to feel differently? And then the third one is, um, is called attentional deployment, which is where we focus on something else. So it's mm -hmm. in, in the example of, if we go with the example of overwhelm, it could be, I'm not going to think about me. I'm going to put all of my attention on something else. I'm just going to focus on, on mm -hmm. that person that's speaking over there. And I'm just going to listen to every single word they've got to say. Because if, if all I'm thinking about is, is, is them and what they're saying and what they're doing, then I'm going to focus all of my attention on there. Or it might be, oh, I'm feeling overwhelmed. There's a window. I'm going to look at the window and I'm going to just put all of my attention out there. And I'm going to, I'm going to forget what's happening in here. I'm going to turn off everything that's going on around me. And I'm just going to think about what's going on outside. So it's where you, you take your attention and you put it on something else. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, so, and you can do it again, a combination of those things. So you might say, I'm going to look out the window because that's where mm -hmm. I, that's that's safe that's safe mm -hmm. out there it doesn't feel safe in here so feel safe outside i'm going to look out the window i'm also going to tell myself mm -hmm. it's okay you're strong whatever it is you want to tell yourself mm -hmm. um you know I'm, I'm okay i'm all right um this is okay i can work i can mm -hmm. think about this later or um uh, hold it together or whatever it is i might be thinking and i'm breathing at the same time so i could do mm -hmm. i could combine all three together tension elsewhere think differently to feel mm -hmm. differently and modulate the response through for example my breathing mm -hmm. um and then the, the other two families um which you can use mm -hmm. sort of proactively um and sometimes reactively um is around how do i how do i change the situation or how do i get myself out of the situation so i might go excuse me i need the toilet um, mm -hmm. and, and I get up and I leave, um, because I can't, I can't, there's no window, so I can't look outside. I feel like everyone's staring at me. Um, uh, I, mm -hmm. my mind is so overwhelmed with, with thoughts of, of sadness that I can't take it anymore. So I, i I give myself a reason to leave. So I go, oh, I'm really sorry. Um, uh, mm -hmm. I, I've got to go to the toilet. Or if you're on a, if you're on a video conference, you might go, oh, there's somebody at the door. Um, and, and you, you turn your camera off so that people can't see you anymore. Um, so you can sort mm -hmm. of get, take yourself out of the situa situation. So uh, that one's called situation selection, where you take yourself mm -hmm. out of it. Um, and the other one is called mm -hmm. situation modification, which is where you think, right, how can I change this situation? How do I get the attention off me? So if everyone's looking at me and mm -hmm. I'm feeling really overwhelmed, I might go, ah, well, Lizzie, what do you think? What's, what are your views on on this particular mm -hmm. thing to try and get the attention away from me and uh, and, and onto something mm -hmm. else or someone else um and you can also mm -hmm. use those two things proactively so it might be that you think well i know that if i go into this particular type of meeting with this particular person that makes me overwhelmed so i'm actually not going to go into that meeting because i don't need mm -hmm. to so i'm just not going to bother um mm -hmm. and there might be other times where you could go right. How do I change that situation? Um, but I, I feel like I'm very, veering off topic a little bit. But I think if we think about those five families of situation selection, can I can I take myself in or out of it? Mm -hmm. Situation modification, can I change the situation so it so it's emotionally easier for me? Uh, attentional deployment, mm -hmm. can I put the focus and the attention somewhere else? Cognitive change or reframe, can I think of can I think differently to feel differently? And then response modulation. How do I how do I regulate the the, the physiological feelings that I have? Um, because yeah. Okay. Is um when it comes to client work and the projects and people you've worked with over the years in workplaces, what do most people opt for? And um, when they're like, well, you can see that they're like trying to process an emotion and they trying trying to manage it or well work with the emotion. What do most people opt for? Um, so often it's a mix. Um, uh, the The response modulation is is most common and most destructive, especially if the response modulation is to suppress it or repress it and never let it out. So, so mm -hmm. in your example, the of the overwhelm, regulating it in that moment or in that meeting or in that that conversation. 
uh, can be really helpful because you don't want to be expressing it in that moment because for whatever reason it's a, it's inappropriate. Um, if then you don't express it in another way at another time, it's just going to sit there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and and that links into what um, emotion researchers will often describe as a flooding out episode. So. Um, mm -hmm. if you feel it and then you, you kind of suppress it, you push it back down again, and then you might remember that mm -hmm. overwhelm that you felt earlier on in the day. And then you go, Oh yeah, but I still can't express it. So you suppress it again. And then someone says, Oh, mm -hmm. were you all right earlier on? You looked a bit upset. No, 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 I was fine. And then you suppress it again. Um, at some point, if you don't express that emotion in another way, what will happen is that emotion mm -hmm. will come pouring out. And, and it sometimes it's described mm -hmm. as the straw that broke the camel's back. Sometimes it's described as the mm -hmm. as the bursting of the dam. Sometimes it's described as the you know the the cork popping out of the bottle. You know, whatever it is that because what happens is that emotion hasn't been you haven't worked with that emotion in a way where you can let it go. So it's still there to go back to my Elsa bits from earlier on. And then what happens is it comes flooding out. And and essentially mm -hmm. at the risk of being a real nerd that's the the whole premise of frozen as a film was one big mm -hmm. flooding out episode so a character had spent wow. years and years and years suppressing and suppressing and suppressing and suppressing and then it got to the point where she mm -hmm. just couldn't hold it in anymore and then out it all came mm -hmm. um so the you know a hugely popular disney film that's gone on to be a um, West End production and has had a sequel made that wasn't mm -hmm. quite as good as the first one um, essentially is mm -hmm. about somebody who who yeah had a flooding out episode and that flooding out episode froze mm -hmm. the kingdom of Arendelle mm -hmm. created an eternal I guess in winter. that way as well it... mm -hmm. it's going to break, it's gonna break yes. into song then Again. <laughs> it could be a great metaphor and I guess it's like that's yeah really interesting I guess thing you've spotted and I think maybe it does speak to the fact that maybe suppressing emotions is a fairly common thing that like we all do yeah. um and, and to answer your question yeah, I don't know if you would agree with that. yeah you know I, I, it, it is um and to answer your question from earlier on I, I see that commonly in teams so what I see mm -hmm. in teams is the is the ag the, the build-up of a number of different things and then creates the flooding out episode which might be in tears, um, sometimes might be in frustration. You know, it's a it's a pounding of the table and a and a shouting across the room. Um, sometimes mm -hmm. it might be um, a, a storming out the room. Uh, sometimes it might be um, a keyboard warrior. Um, you know, massive long tirade of, of an email that that sent to somebody uh, that sent to somebody else. So the 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 dysregulation of emotion is something that harms teams so that emotion dysregulation mm -hmm. that that inability or that um that unwillingness to regulate emotions often creates dysfunctions in teams um and relationships mm -hmm. and, and and that's where we help that's how we can help and, and mm -hmm. um and and because you're at the risk of being becoming very, I don't know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I, can't, I can't think of the word. But anyway, um, if you think about, I, I was never taught about the five families of, of emotion regulation. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I was I, I learned through experience about the appropriateness of expression of emotion. Um, no one sat me down and, and, and talked about what emotions are and where they come from and how they work and how you can use them and how how important they are for your welfare and how um, yeah how you can can work with them in a, in a constructive way. I'd argue that over the mm -hmm. last you know if you think about it from a school's point of view the the, the personal social health and education or the PSHE curriculum has changed a lot over the last mm -hmm. 10 years but a lot of the people that are in the workplace now weren't at school 10 years ago they were at school 10 20 30 40 50 years ago um and so if they've never mm -hmm. had that opportunity to to i don't know to, to know or to engage or work with their emotions in different ways then they don't know any better um 
so just mm-hmm. just yesterday uh, was with a client um uh could see they were frustrated um they asked a member of the team something the member of the team said two or three words and then they said you know what no don't worry it doesn't matter um uh, you, this person and then spoke to their boss and said this person needs some help get them some help because they can't do it on their own um and so i sat down with that individual afterwards and said tell me about that tell me about what was kind of happening for you then what was going on for you then what were you thinking what were you feeling um mm-hmm. it was i was annoyed that we hadn't done the thing that we said we were going to do um i was uh, annoyed that um we haven't given that person the resources that they need to do the job that we're asking them to do well um and i was um uh, nervous that we he didn't say nervous what did he say I can't remember I'm going to say nervous nervous that we would fail again okay so now put yourself in that individual shoes who you asked a question and they started to speak and then you told them that that you'd heard enough how was that for them what do you mean well, how, how, how might that have been for them so if I said what do you think and then you start talking to me and then I, I just shut you down and say I don't want to hear from you anymore oh yeah yeah, that can't have been very nice. So, so what do you want to do about it? I think I need to go and apologise to them. Yeah, I think so too. Um, it, but it, it wasn't because it wasn't about the individual and it wasn't about what the individual was saying, actually. Um, but what you had in that moment is that individual was, wasn't was able to regulate their emotions in a way that could make that conversation constructive. Because mm-hmm. I said, what would have happened if you'd have let them speak? We'd have wasted time. How much time? I don't know. Give me your best guess. I don't know, a minute? Okay. And in, in the in the scale of a day, if we'd have waited a minute to then say, thank you, we need to get this guy some help because he's, he's, he doesn't have the resources that he needs to do it. What would have been the benefit of of giving that person that minute rather than shutting them down. I suppose if you look at it that way, yeah. And, and what that, for me, what that was missing was that that emotion regulation in that moment to go, I recognize I'm frustrated with the situation. I recognize I'm frustrated with how we've dealt with it. I'm nervous that we might fail again or not, not, not do this thing again. So I've got all of those things. I'm going to hold them and I'm going to make sure that that after I've let this person speak, I then share those concerns that I have, that share that those things are, and it back to my definition at the beginning, these things are important to me, they're relevant to my goals, and therefore I want to talk about them. So saying, I'm frustrated that we've not done this, I'm frustrated that we haven't got the level of support in place, I'm nervous that we're going to not do it again. So this is what I want to happen to make sure that we do deliver and we do make sure we get to where we want to get to now that's easy for me to say right because mm-hmm. i've been working with motions for decades um and so part of mm-hmm. what we're part of our our work then is helping supporting individuals with being able to do stuff like that mm-hmm. Brilliant. yeah really really interesting stuff so given that yeah we've established that In general, people, I guess, aren't really taught that much about emotional regulation, emotional expression, things like that. Is it something that we can learn? And by that emotional regulation, but also emotional intelligence, is that something that we can learn as adults? Yes, definitely. Um, So it's a it's a skill that can be um, uh, that can be developed. And um, and also it can be assessed and tested as well. So if you want to know how emotionally intelligent you are, mm-hmm. um, you can. There's assessments that you can do that would that can give you a, a, a an assessment of that. And then there's things that you can learn and and, and improve and, and be better. So as as an example, um, if if you if we go back to the seven. Um, the seven universal emotions that we described earlier on each of those have a universal trigger so for example or research would suggest that they have a universal trigger so uh, happiness would be something we find pleasurable anger would be an obstruction to a goal fear would be a threat of harm 
Uh, surprise would be something sudden and unexpected. Sadness would be a loss of something that we value. Um, uh, disgust would be something that we find offensive. And then contempt would be where we feel morally superior, as examples. Also, for the listener, I will put a link to a document in the show notes that summarizes all of those things. Um, uh, if, if you're looking to improve your emotional intelligence, you can use that to help you because you can go, ah, I'm feeling something. Mm-hmm. And, and, it, and, this, and if I'm feeling something, that means it's important to me and or it's relevant to my goals. Okay. And then I can use the, um, those universal triggers to help me figure out which emotion or emotions I'm experiencing. Because I might ask myself then, all right, mm-hmm. what am I finding pleasurable in this? Oh, nothing, actually. Right. So it's not happiness then. All right. Um, what, what, what's getting in my way? Which is the question related to anger. Oh, okay. This is getting in my way. Okay. Well, I feel like this is getting, well, probably there's some anger in it then. Um, what threats am I seeing? Oh, I can see there's a threat over here. Okay, so there might be a bit of fear in there as well. Okay. Um, am I feeling like I'm better than somebody else? No, there's probably not any contempt then. Am I feeling like I'm offended? No, so there's probably no disgust in that. Have I lost something? No, so there's probably no sadness. Okay, so in this example then, I'm feeling anger and fear. What do I do want to do about that? Then? Um, and if I mm-hmm. understand what the threat is, I can now manage that threat better. Because I've worked out there's a threat and I've worked out what the threat is. So therefore that helps me regulate my fear. If I understand what my goal is and what's getting in the way, that helps me regulate my anger. And then I am more emotionally intelligent as a result. So yeah, absolutely. It's something mm-hmm. that, that can be learned and um, and developed. And uh, in, in 2024, um, we're launching um, a product called eFactor. So eFactor is a, an objective assessment of emotional intelligence. So it, it uh, has a, a three, three-way assessment. So it has a, an objective assessment of, your, of somebody's knowledge, understanding, skills, and application of emotional intelligence. It also has a self-assessment, and it also has a 360-degree review component, which is where you ask other people about how, you, uh, how emotionally intelligent you are. And then you bring those three things together, and that gives you uh, a, 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 basically a score like you would get an IQ score. Um, so you can get a score out of 200 for how mostly intelligent you are. And that gives you then both a benchmark as to where you are and also helps you identify where where you can get better and, and, and where you can develop. So um, absolutely, it's something you can um, you can learn, you can improve, and you can do it with us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. With... Um... The emotional intelligence assessment is that a fairly new i want to say product as in is it a new invention or has it been around for a while or no does this yeah i'm wanting to understand it. Does this, yeah 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 sorry i interrupted you which is poor on my part sorry um so yes it, it was um no, it's okay. so it, it was researched by cliff lansley um who uh mm-hmm. for his uh, phd um and Cliff and I have known each other for, for years and he, he published his PhD in 2022 and then this tool became available in 2023. Um, and it, so there are a number of other emotional intelligence assessment tools on the market. So there's one called uh, EQI. There's one um, called uh, one from uh, from Baron, I think it is. Um, and there's another one called Mesquite. Um, and what eFactor does mm-hmm. is it it closes all of the gaps that those other tools have. So, for example, um, if you look at um, the EQI, for example, that um, relies on self-assessment. So it relies on my assessment of myself to be like, do I think I'm emotionally intelligent? Um, Whereas something like Mesquite has um, like a, a more of a test in it, a test of your knowledge and your understanding of emotions. One of the challenges with Mesquite is it was done in the 1960s and the methodology they used to decide what was the correct answer in the assessment is a bit flawed. Um, so the way that um, eFactor has done that is much more robust in terms of the methodology it's used to decide what's the right and wrong um, element. And one of the other challenges with um, the other emotion, emotional intelligence assessment tools is they don't account for context so they don't say Mm -hmm. in this situation 
what is the emotionally intelligent response to what's happening whereas e factor does that so it has a number of situational judgment tests where it says here's a situation whether that be it could be a described situation or it could be a there's a video for you to watch to understand what the situation is and then it asks you what's the most emotionally intelligent next response to this situation so it's not about what would you do normally or what would you do if you're with your family or what would you do with your friends or what would you do if you're at work it's like here's a situation what's the most emotionally intelligent response to this situation um uh, and then uh, and the, the way they went about it then is they had a they engaged a group of 100 um, uh, researchers, so the 100 kind of peer-reviewed researchers in the world of emotional intelligence. They also got um, a bank of uh, practitioners, so people that are uh, kind of known within the world. Not necessarily they haven't done the peer-reviewed research academic bit, but they're known as emotional intelligence experts in their field, and they gave them these situations. It says, what are your judgments? So what are your judgments of the most emotionally intelligent response to these situations? Um, and th- at that point, there was we, there was loads of situations, and then they, and then they looked at where was the agreement. So where was the agreement that A was the mm-hmm. most emotionally intelligent response to that situation, and where that agreement was high, um, uh, then that was considered then the right answer to to what it is. So there's there's that kind of um, mm-hmm. duality of or dual component of reliability to it that you've got high mm-hmm. correlation of agreement between people that yes this option a or b or c or d is the most emotionally intelligent response in situation one mm-hmm. right okie dokes okay. i don't know are we at time for our final question yeah i think so i think we're, we're at like an hour and a quarter so i think if the listener's been with us this long maybe one more question mm-hmm. um would be good to wrap it up yeah Okay, so my final question, and it's kind of imagining I'm a person who's gone on this journey that we've been on on this podcast. So I've identified my emotions and kind of what's triggered the emotion. I've understood that the situation right now is not right for me to express it. Mm -hmm. So I've regulated my emotion using one of the five um, families of emotional regulation. So I'm back home later the same day and I'm like, right, I have time now. I'm on my own. I have time to feel that emotion i don't want to suppress it because i don't want a flooding out episode how do i go about letting out an emotion in that way if i've yeah i've got dedicated time for it what should i do how can i do that um so it, it depends really on on a how much time you've got b how much structure you want to put around it mm-hmm. um uh <laughs> And, and I feel like there was a C, but I can't remember what it was. So, um, uh, one example um, might be that I want to just go sit in the shower and cry. So, um, you know, I'm just going to mm-hmm. go and I'm going to go sit in the shower and I'm just going to cry. So that could be one way um, to do it. Mm-hmm. Or I could put on some. I could deliberately choose to put on some sad songs that are going to bring back that overwhelm and that sadness that I felt earlier on because I want to bring it I want to bring it forward I want to to express it and get it all out of my system so that I can kind of feel 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 lighter afterwards um uh I could also um and then so I suppose there's that I'm I'm going to describe it as as raw I suppose that that raw expression of it and just kind of going right I've I've been holding it in I'm not going to do that anymore and out it comes um I might need something to help it so you know the sad music could be something to help it, and then, and then, and then I do. Um, also, you could put a bit more structure around it, in terms of um, maybe asking yourself some questions. Um, so I'm a massive fan of reflective practice, um, uh, and and there's we could go into more detail, but I won't. I'll keep it simple. Um, so I could do some reflective practice on it in terms of going. What did I feel then? Why did I feel what I felt? What do I feel now? What do I think I want to do about it? Mm-hmm. And then what are my actions? So uh, I don't use why questions very often. Um, and in this example, I think why can be helpful in terms of you know why, why did I feel what I felt? Because what that, that helps me do is figure out what that trigger might be. Um, 
so I could have a number of questions that I might ask myself to, to go um, to help me work through what that emotion is. Um, and I think I think using the thinking and the feeling aspects is useful. So what did I feel then? Why did I feel it? What do I feel now? Um, what do I think I want to do about it? What do I actually want to do about it? Um, could be five useful questions to to help work through that expression. And it could be that I express it out loud. Um, mm -hmm. It could be that I write it down in a journal if I want to keep a, a record of of the different things that, that I'm feeling. It could be that I just have those questions on a sticky note on my you know on my desk or um, or somewhere that I can ask myself the questions and um, and work my way through the answers. Yeah. I think yeah, those are kind of some fab takeaway things because they're like they're easy things for us to do and easy questions for us to ask ourselves. So okay. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Lizzie. So, um, as we sort of move towards closing the podcast off, then uh, we'll I'll move on to our um, our closing question, um, uh, which would be around what surprised you. So, I'm going to ask you what surprised you within uh, within today's episodes. Mm -hmm. But before we do that, as you'll have heard, as we've worked our way through um, this particular episode, one of the things that we do a lot of work on is with teams and the uh, the safe and the constructive expression of emotion is something that can differentiate um, low to high performing teams. It's something that can create close and constructive relationships or can create distant and destructive relationships. So if something that you want to improve on is how your team is engaging with each other and the uh, relative emotional safety to express how you feel in your teams, then give us a call. Get in touch with us at phil at emotionalwork.co.uk and we'll be able to help you out. All right then, Lizzie. Um, what surprised you from the podcast today? Just the sheer amount of knowledge that you have when you were citing all those different reference papers, and I was like, "How? How have you even remembered all of this? Let alone like knowing exactly when to pull on that piece of knowledge because that's relevant here and that's relevant here." That just yeah amazed me because I just don't think I have that level of like memory retainment. Um, so yeah, that's what surprised me. Wonderful. Thank you, Lizzie. And thank you so much for your questions. I, I really enjoyed, uh, yeah, really enjoyed our conversation today. Um, and then uh, what we'll do is we'll make sure in the show notes, we put links to all of the different research papers that I've cited. Um, and mm -hmm. also we'll put those, uh, mm -hmm. those reflective questions uh, in there as well. Uh, and then I'll say, yeah, Lizzie, thank you so much. Thank you, Phil. Um, and thank you to whoever is listening. I hope it's been useful. You've been listening to the Emotion Thank at Work you. podcast and if you got this far, you must be interested in the role that emotions have in the workplace either within individuals, between people in teams or in organisations as a whole. So head over to the Emotion at Work hub which you can find at community.emotionatwork.co.uk Thanks for listening. Thank you.